You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and thank you for joining uh, us for our very special fourth Champagne Bubble Show. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we're joined tonight by Kristen LaRochelle from Slocum & Sons Distributors. Kristen, great to have you back thank on you. our show. Thank oh, I, I'm so excited to have you back, Kristen. It's, awesome. I can't even tell you. And, you know, it's exciting for both Jim and I because it's our fourth holiday theme show. And we always do bubbles. And we have some spectacular ones to taste tonight. And uh, they cover the whole price spectrum. And there's some really... Expensive ones here tonight, but I'm looking forward to them. So Yeah, we normally do wines that are under $20, but we always kind of splurge for the holidays. And Kristen, you have really gone overboard tonight, so I, I can't wait to try what you've brought here. Let's, uh, let's talk about our first one tonight. Okay. Uh, this is the Mianetto Prosecco? Yeah, so um, I wanted to bring, um, obviously we've got some champagne here, but I thought a good place to start would be Prosecco. Um, obviously Prosecco is not champagne, different grapes, it's from Italy. Um, but as far as um, for the holidays, when you have a lot of parties to go to and you have a budget in mind, Prosecco is a really great alternative um, and it's really easy on your pocket. So um, I brought Mianetto. Uh, Mianetto is uh, probably one of the largest um, or uh, biggest selling Proseccos in the United States right now. Um, they've been making wine since uh, late 1800s. Wow. And uh, they have kind of a whole array of uh, different price points and different wines that they make. Um, so for the purposes of today, I brought just their basic uh, Prosecco Brut. Um, and uh, Just really quick, I'm curious, when you say a wide variety of price points, what makes a more expensive Prosecco? Like, uh, with, how do they determine, is it just a, a particular vineyard or the grape that they're getting it from? Well, yep, yeah, for the most part, um, Prosecco is made from Glera. That's the grape in most Proseccos. Um, but if you notice on the bottle here, it says DOC. I don't know if it says on the front, I'm sure it does. Um, there are variations for the designations, the same way there are variations in France, um, where you'll see DOC, DOCG. And all that is is just a way of uh, assuring um, you as a consumer of quality. So the different price points can mean, you know, purchased fruit versus a little bit more handcrafted um, styles. So and, and all this just changed back in 2009. You know, the Italians used to market uh, Prosecco and, and let anyone else in the world grow the Prosecco grape and call it Prosecco. And then they said, yo, we've got to do the same thing the French are doing. Raining it and, in a little. And so they changed the name of yeah. the grape to Glera. It used to be it was all called Prosecco. And now you know, they had people in Australia growing Prosecco mm -hmm. and people in you know, Brazil growing Prosecco. Uh, and that's why the Italians said, we've got to protect this, and let's call this Galera. And now the only bottle that can have Prosecco on it is something from Italy. Yeah, and they also um, actually just kind of ramped up their uh, rules with DO, DOC, and DOCG, because mm -hmm. there used to be every bottle would say DO on it. Um, so now uh, DOC is what DO used to be, and then DOCG is, I mean, we can get so, to So, yeah, this gets very confusing here, but, for the people at uh, home. But quality. Well, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Let's actually see if this is a Perfecto Prosecco. All right. Yeah, it wasn't a Perfecto Prosecco. Look at you, Ryman. We haven't even drank yet. Very light. It's great. It's creamy. And this is, I serve this a lot. So I, I, you brought a bottle that I was very familiar with, and I'm glad you great. did. Uh, this is, and just like you said, it's uh, a great thing to take to a party. It's inexpensive. It's pleasing to the palate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Proseccos tend to be a little sweeter than champagne, so it's easy drinking for most people. Um, and they're usually lower in alcohol, too. Uh, Proseccos are... This one, I believe, is about 11%. Okay. Um, this is a drier style. The region that, that Mionato actually comes from is the Veneto. And, and when you have grapes from that northeast region of Italy, they tend to be a little drier, crisper, fresher. So really great as a way to start out um, a dinner party. Um, like as an aperitif or, you know, with like lighter style food. Um, it's not super heavy. Um, it also makes really great cocktails. Mm -hmm, I can see I that. I do bellinis with this all the time. Oh, yeah. 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 
it doesn't overpower one way or the other. So um, you can buy this um, for probably around, I don't know, depending on your local retailer, thirteen ninety nine to sixteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, certainly a, a fair price for uh, the quality you're drinking. And it's everywhere. You yeah. can find it just about everywhere. It is everywhere. And just for our concerned viewers, because I know there's always a some out there that are a little sensitive, Kristen is expecting. <laughs> she will be smelling with us tonight and pouring except maybe when we get to the except, last one. Except the last one. The last one, one she probably might, she, just a little bit. So don't get your dander yeah. up tonight. Yeah. So this is, a, a, this is really delicious. And yeah. I, I know that this uh, would be a great addition to any, anybody's holiday table yeah. to start off, especially early on. Really affordable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they actually come in these really great little sizes too. I don't know if you, if you go to the, the, the summertime, if you go to the beach, um, they come in little 187 milliliter bottles, which yes, is like a single right. serving. Excellent. Um, which, you know. Is that what all the celebrities are drinking with a straw? Probably. All the models you see yeah. back there, they're like, this is water. It's water. I can't see you drinking <laughs> a bubbles with a straw, no. though. I would just think the sugar would get I to know, you so fast. Yeah. Something else I've seen is Prosecco in a can. Yeah, yeah. I've never tried it. I haven't either. I, I don't I, know how I feel about it, but, you know, teach their own, I suppose. Yeah, there's a certain aspect of wine snobbery that I'd like to continue with drinking <laughs> out of a glass. So I'll still keep drinking mine out of a flute, I think, yeah. mostly. So. Yeah. All right, that's a big thumbs up for our first uh, delicious one Double for thumbs. the show. Double yes. Um, all right, so we're going to move on here to a grower champagne. So um, are you guys familiar with grower champagnes? No, please no, tell please us. Please tell us, yeah. Okay, well, um, in Champagne, France, there are probably 19,000 individual growers wow. of the grapes that go into Champagne, um, and about that makes up about 88 uh 88% of the pro total production of champagne. Um, the other percentage is um, big champagne houses that grow their own grapes. Mm -hmm. So the growers, um, essentially you could have a, a row of just vineyard owned by one guy, and then a row of another vineyard owned by another guy, and so on and so forth. And what they do is they grow, it, it kind of keeps um, you know, the agriculture market there, fair, the economy for everybody that wants to be a grower, and it mm -hmm. stays in their families. Um, and then they, most of them sell their fruit to um, uh, other champagne houses. Um, but about a very small percentage of those growers make their own champagnes. I'd say um, maybe about 5,000 of those growers um, out of 20,000. Okay. So th th uh, when you see a grower champagne, this is actually a champagne that has been made by the people that grew the grapes themselves. Wow. So, and a lot of them pool their resources together. Um, so the difference between a grower champagne and maybe something, um, a, a larger champagne house, is the actual style of the wine will be a little bit more terroir specific mm -hmm. than um, like a cuvee from multiple places. Yeah, so the that larger houses sense. are just blending grapes from all over the champagne area. Correct. Okay. And I yep. know we've discussed it before, but it's also important for our viewers to remember that now we are actually drinking champagne. We've gone from a sparkling Prosecco yep. Yep. to an actual champagne. So the price is going to be more expensive to begin with, but it's actually from the region that's mm -hmm. allowed for them to call champagne. Yep. So uh, that's why I'm excited. And then, <laughs> and we covered this in a, uh, last year when we talked about champagnes, but this, this is actually fermented for the second time in the bottle. Um, versus this this one particular this one is yes it's okay a secondary fermentation in the bottle yep whereas prosecco is uh, fermented in Charmant steel method. yep 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 correct so um, but the real kind of delightful thing about the Volero is uh, it is a grower champagne but it's actually very very affordable so when you get in those higher tier of champagnes that we're going to talk about after um, they tend to stretch a little bit your budget this is something that you can say it is you know, you're su supporting a local farmer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's actually, you know, retails for twenty nine ninety nine. Oh, that's a very certainly affordable, reachable yep. price point for most people who want an actual champagne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good. And, you know, I, I will say quickly that the bubbles are beautiful up there. That's got a beautiful color. It's got mm -hmm. a strawish color. Mm -hmm. Definitely a, a different yeast. I wonder, is yeasty the right word? Yep. Uh, that's a good adjective. It's yeasty, but in a good way. The only only time you'll ever talk about that is when you're drinking right. champagne. <laughs> That's delicious. Or bread. Or bread. Mm -hmm. Speaking of bread, it's very toasty as well. It is very toasty, mm -hmm. and uh, it's one of those examples of a flavor that, um, compared to some of the sparklings we've done in the past, there's definitely a difference here in yeah. how it feels in your mouth, how it tastes, and uh, even though we've had some good sparklings. I think this is an example of when it comes to actual champagne, even though it's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. The taste is definitely more noticeably different. And for those of you who are looking for a little bit of, um, you know, recognition in your wines when you're sharing them with people, this actually just got uh, 92 points Wine Spectator this year. 
Um, and they do make a rosé that's beautiful, and they make a uh, one called a cuvee marguerite, which is very beautiful as well. Current vintage is 07, so if you see that, buy that. It's beautiful. Um, but and not all champagnes have a vintage year. I'm glad you mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it has to be, is, is it normally when it's a really good year that they, they put a, a vintage on yeah. it? Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's actually really good that you brought that up because one of the hard things about being a grower champagne house is that you, are, you live and die by those vines that you are using. You don't have the luxury um, that Clicquot or Krug or um, Laurent Perrier have that they could you know, make up what they're losing in a bad year from a bunch of different places. If, mm -hmm. if there's a bad storm that hits a, an area very hard and that's the grower's area, there's, there's no wine. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and typically depending on the year, if the weather is great um, and you have an abundance of fruit, then you can start doing vintage which is really nice, as opposed to a cuvee of different years. Well, fascinating information, and I, I want to quickly say that when it comes to champagnes, is there a shelf life on them? Can you keep them stored properly for years, even if there's not a vintage date on them? Well, I, I can. Oh, well, <laughs> and that's all that matters. Yeah. Well, Kristen said I, that. I mean, my, my suggestion always is, uh, you know, I mean, if, you're, if you don't have like a cellar, but you just try to keep it in um, a, somewhere that's a little bit, um, you know, darker and cooler and um, you know don't keep them high up on a shelf where mm -hmm. it gets hotter um, and don't stand them up if you have yeah. an opportunity to lie them down um, they actually do better that way yeah Bob brought out a bottle once his parents had hidden it away in the cellar for years and years but it was it on top of a radiator oh. it was near the heating surface but it was from the early 80s yeah oh it breaks my heart it was bad <laughs> it was so bad but it was a great science experiment yeah. <laughs> to learn how not to store wine so it uh, we were excited for a moment because I think it was sort of a good bottle. Yeah. But as soon as that cork came oh. out, you realized that, uh, yeah, those days were long gone. That breaks my heart. I go, I, you know, if I, if I go into a retailer and they're like, oh, all our fine wine is up here and it's just all standing up mm -hmm. there and yeah. collecting dust and heat, probably not going to buy those bottles. That's my advice to you guys. Don't buy those bottles. One other point I did want to mention, uh, we were talking about when to drink the wine. Uh, Prosecco usually is something you're supposed to drink right away. It's, yeah. That's, not, that's mm -hmm. not meant to be put down and stored for years. Mm -hmm. Whereas with champagne, you can you can put that away for a while. You can. I, I, I say drink champagne anytime, but yeah. you know that's just. Well, that's and that's <laughs> that's the other thing is the Italians will actually tell you prosecco should only be drunk in the spring. Now I drink I drink it year round. You yeah, drink it year round, yeah. but yeah. but yeah. I, I, that's me treating it like champagne. And yep. Champagne can be drunk anytime. Yeah, especially like a lot of like northern Italian wines are meant to be drank. Um, you know really young and fresh mm -hmm. just because the style of food that they pair well really well with and the actual soils that they come from the minerality in the wines um, are better when they're young livelier fruitier yeah. you know they don't have a chance to kind of fade yeah i want to tell our viewers you know obviously this is our fourth holiday show themed with bubbles sparkling champagne experiment yourself i mean these are just some ideas but uh, learn from what we're drinking here and when you go to your own local wine store or distributor mm -hmm. or whatever you, you buy your booze from you know Experiment, just yeah. like we or do here. go back and watch our other three episodes. Or do that, too. That's true. <laughs> We've had a lot of good yeah. champagne on this show. Yes, we have, actually. And uh, this is going to be the pinnacle of our experience, I think, this particular show. Oh, yeah. So, all right, should, thumbs up on that one. Yeah. That's for sure. I was, gonna, I was just going to say, you should have a party this year, and everyone bring a, a bottle of sparkling and, and, and do it that way. Well, Kristen, that <laughs> sort of happened at Jim's place a few years back. And Didn't end up well for you everybody. You can't just drink sparkling the whole evening because then you end up with a little bit of a... Uh, well, drink water. Yes. It's a little bit too much <laughs> sugar, I think, for just <laughs> sticking to bubbles the whole evening. It's yeah, leave your troubles in the bubbles, as they say. I like that. But I like that. Um, moving okay. on, then? We're moving we're on to number three. three. All right. So, sorry, I should, I'm the closest to it. I should pour it for you. And the lady, mm -hmm. so you will get your first pour. So, Veuve Clicquot, um, they actually are some of the largest well, maybe not the largest, but they have actually quite a bit of land acreage in Champagne. Um, so a lot of their, um, you know, wines come from them um, <laughs> on their own estate. Um, I, you know, I have a soft spot for Veuve Clicquot just because it's kind of this quintessential story of, um, you know, women in business before women were really allowed to, to kind of run things. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, the story goes is the, the, the widow Clicquot, her husband had passed away, she took over the company. And in the first year that she took over, um, she shipped out over 100,000 bottles of champagne um, and made a house style. And, um, you know, so she's a role model, role model she's for women. She's done quite well. And yeah. so she did quite well. They've done quite well for themselves since then. It's a very respected name. 
It is, and yeah. Can't go wrong bringing a bottle of Clicquot to a party. No, no and, one will be angry. And this is a little bit lighter in the straw call that we had with the, uh, the previous, mm -hmm. um, but the bubbles still seem just as effervescent as uh, the one we just had before. So the predominant grape in this, um, first, well, pop quiz, you guys should know this is your fourth sparkling <laughs> show, but what are the grapes in Champagne? Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, mm -hmm. and Pinot Minuet. You get the red star. <laughs> <laughs> My mouth was still ex exploding in orgasmic delight with this last sip I just had. Yeah. This is good. So this, um, this actually uh, is predominantly Pinot Noir, I'd say mm. about 55%. Um, and then you have uh, Chardonnay is kind of the finesse. And then mm. the Pinot Minier is just a, like the, the backbone and the raciness and the structure. So, so they use all three for this one. They do. Okay. And um, the, the house style, I don't know if you've ever had the Clico Demisec, which is a white label. No. It's actually no. um, a little more off dry. Um, and that was, that was originally for the champagne style of, at the time back then. They liked everything very sweet. They sold a lot of champagne to the yeah. Russians. Mm -hmm. right. And they wanted sweet, sweet, sweet. So Demisec, which is sweeter than this, was considered semi-dry. By, the, what they, by the Russians. By the, okay. by the Russians. And then this was even dry. So this is their brute dry. And, mm -hmm. and it's funny, when I taste people on this, they still say, wow, this is pretty fruity. And this is their dry style, so. Yeah, it's funny uh, that you mentioned Russian champagne. Uh, there, there is Russian champagne, correct? I mean, well, I not champagne, not, but. I have never had Russian champagne. Or Russian sparkling, have you ever had? No I idea? have not. That's interesting. Cause I, yeah. I thought at one time uh, Russia was actually one of the major importers. Well, you always hear about caviar being the great pair yeah. with champagne. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how about currently, so. like over the last, maybe like just before, you know, when the czar was still around. Hmm. Um, but Russia. There's a blind spot in my knowledge. Is, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting because I know they used to love drinking sparkling in Russia. And I'm just not sure what that time frame was where hmm. it stopped. Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to make a comeback now with some of their own sparkling. But I haven't heard much about it. Yeah, so. no. That's definitely, um, you know, you just kind of piqued my nerd sensor. So now I'm going to have to that's good. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a blind spot. You didn't think you were getting homework tonight, did you? I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited now. There's something I don't know. And I want to say, this one's definitely not as yeasty as the, the previous. No. This is a little bit smoother. It is. Yep. Um, still just as good, but good in a different way. I, I always like to compare it uh, taste-wise to people who don't drink a whole lot of wine uh, to a Prosecco, because a Prosecco is so creamy and easy to drink. Mm -hmm. And a lot of champagnes, uh, especially at the low end, come off a little harsh, mm -hmm. whereas this, this is a very easy drinking champagne. Not a whole lot of yeast, not a whole lot of bite to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's what's important because, you know, if you're like us, uh, when you're having a party for the holidays and you start off with bubbles, whether it be champagne or sparkling, you sort of want it to be a little bit on the smoother mm -hmm. side. You don't want to, yeah. like, shock your, your guest palate too much, I would say, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, unless you really want to cause trouble for the rest of the evening. So it's <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is priced well enough that you probably could have more than one and cause trouble and not feel bad about it. And what's roughly the price point on this um, one? It, Right now, it varies in Connecticut. You could probably find a bottle for 45 to 55 depending on where you are in your retailer. And well, this you bring up another interesting point. Um, champagne prices tend to rise right before That's Christmas, true. Thanksgiving, New Year's. No, yes and no. I'd say Connecticut specifically, if you're going to buy champagne, this month is a good month to buy it mm -hmm. because... Um, a lot of retailers are all competing for the same dollar. Okay. So a lot of them go for the champagne as their, their uh, way to lure you in. So okay. if you're going to buy champagne, um, look around for sales and look around for your, um, your local guys because a lot of them are selling their champagnes at lower prices this month. But if you wait till the day before New Year's yeah, Eve, then, yeah. you well, you're you're then it's your own fault. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Then it's your own fault. Then you're going to get, you know, some version of Clico. It's going to be spelled with a W and with a K, Clico. You know? <laughs> and it's going to be apple juice. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to have carbonation in it, but that's it. Well, yeah. you know, and that's the other thing that I, uh, I did a little research before the show, and I didn't realize that some champagne manufacturers, and this is typically at the lower end, but they actually add carbon dioxide to kind of speed up the, the bubbling process. Yeah. They, they want to rush this to market, so they kind of they cheat a little bit. Well, that's also kind of, you know, in a lot of ways in the Charmat method, when you can add a little bit of the, into the, the tanks, mm -hmm. um, it just creates a lighter style, which typically you wouldn't have in something that's been like handcrafted, um, like Clico. Um, fun fact about Clico, if you care about that kind of thing. We like fun um, <laughs> Do you guys know what riddling is? That's when you're, you're turning the bottles? Mm -hmm. I've actually watched a Frenchman do that. Really? Yes. There are professional riddlers. Yes. And they, um, they don't know riddles, but they do know how to spin bottles very, very fast. Do we know why they do that? They're turning the yeast. 
returning the yeast, yep, and then it, it can actually pop out of the bottle when they do disgorgement. So you get, um, champagnes used to be cloudy mm -hmm. before they started riddling them. And um, Vu Clicquot is the first house to actually invent the riddling table. The oh. widow Clicquot wow. um, invented that. Fascinating. So, that is fascinating. A little fun now, fact for you. It, that used to be a hazardous job because the, uh, when you were riddling, the cork could shoot out and sometimes it would cause a chain reaction. Oh, so yeah. all the bottles would start going off in the, in the wine cave. Just popping everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes, you know, they're exploding. So you've got glass flying all over the place. I imagine the Riddlers had like a patch, eye patches. <laughs> you, know, you know what's also interesting tonight is, because uh, we're drinking some nicer stuff, I don't think we mentioned, did we mention we were drink, using our Riedel glass system? We did not. Oh. Well, let's so mention I, that. I wanted to make sure we had the right glass to serve the really high-end stuff in. So I brought the Riedel champagne flutes out tonight. And if we have enough time, we'll do a little taste off and, and taste uh, in a regular champagne flute and the Riedel and see oh, yeah. if there is a difference. Oh, wow. All but right. Uh, from, from our experience in the past, <laughs> we know there is a difference. Yeah, so. well, I don't, we've never tasted uh, two in, uh, flutes, though, champagne We flutes. haven't done champagne, no. Yeah, so that's interesting. Well, the Mercedes-Benz of the evening is coming up here. Or actually, should I say the Ferrari or the uh, Lamborghini? I think that's the better Lamborghini. Analogy, yes. Like uh, the Aston Martin yes, the, the price point we don't <laughs> normally touch here on the show. And uh, Kristen, I'll let you uh, give a little explanation of what we're going to be tasting well, next. Well, before we get sticker shock, and, and um, you know, I often encounter um, a lot of pushback um, regarding price point for Krug or any of those prestige cuvées. Um, just, you know, because I don't think really uh, there's a lot of understanding of why it's going to be at that price point. And um, so Krug is probably one of the oldest luxury prestige cuvee houses in, Cham in Champagne. Um, uh, the founder, Joseph Krug, his philosophy was that Champagne should be all about pleasure and it should be drank with friends and it should be enjoyed as such. It, it shouldn't be overthought and it shouldn't be anything that isn't accessible to everyone. I now love that, this guy already. <laughs> <laughs> seems like a pretty small guy. Um, and for a long, long time, Krug, um, I think, was a little bit more under the radar in the market. And they recently discovered some of his journals, um, his original journals that he used to take notes in. And it kind of opened their eyes as a, as a champagne house as that he really wanted to share this love of champagne with the world and that making it really kind of exclusive was was preventing the world from enjoying it the same way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you might see a little bit more Krug out and about now just because, you know, we're definitely trying to share that message with people as uh, now. Um, now, the reason this is so special um, is there are, they only use Grand Cru and uh, Premier Cru grapes. And um, a really cool, um, like, you know, little fact about Krug is um, they use a lot of growers and every year they actually open up their caves to those growers to come mm. in and taste the wines mm. that their grapes made, which is very, um, you know, very lovely experience for the grower because most sure. of the time they sell their grapes, they never see it again. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the majority of their grapes obviously is made up of those growers. Um, the rest of the wine is actually made up, um, you know, 33, well, a, a large percentage of reserve wines. So there could be, you know, 12 year, 15 year old wine in that bottle. They have a library of yeah, thousands of bottles. So every year when they make Grand Cuvée, they're trying to recreate that style okay. using vintages from 15, 20 years ago. So it's almost like scotch where they're, you know, they're, they're keeping some back every year and, exactly. and blending it in just a little at a time yep. into the current batch. Yeah. So everything you're wow. getting in that bottle is the best of Krug's history. Hmm. So it it's, it's, doesn't have an age statement on it, but you know, on average, you know, 12 to 15 year old uh, wines. And also they, um, they actually cellar them wines before they release them for a lot longer than most champagne houses. I think they, they keep them six, seven years okay. um, in the cellar before they release a Grand Cuvée. Um, and there's a very cool, if you buy a bottle of Krug, if you look on the back, um, there's something called Krug ID. Yeah, yeah. Yep, where you can actually go to the Krug website and type in that ID, and it gives you the history of the bottle. Oh, that's awesome. I like um, that. You know, what, you know, what grapes, what years. Uh, it's very, very, very cool. Um, so enough about that. Yeah, I got to say, I'm really excited <laughs> here. It's, it's a, I feel like I'm opening a Christmas present here under the Christmas tree. I don't drink this too often. Christmas came early this year, Bob. Baby's first Krug. Mm. You're here with me. Distinctly different. Yeah, the there's so time. much fruit in this, and 
But normally, it's not overpowering. No, but normally when you drink champagne, it's a very subtle fruit, if there's any fruit at all. And usually it's, it's a lot of yeast with champagnes. And this, I get a very strong fruit taste mm -hmm. with this. Uh, at first, but it mellows out very it quickly. It doesn't stay, it doesn't yeah. linger very yeah. long. It's just sort of, it hits you and then it just sort of yeah. dissipates very slowly. Um, I like that. I, I do like too. that a lot. It's, a, it's got a lot of lemon and um, mm -hmm. it, it's very rich, um, but really elegant style. Um, you know, I highly recommend if you have not had Grand Cuvée to buy it and, and just treat yourself. Um, the rosé is spectacular as well. Um, but they also, they have some vintages. So in those years when they have um, extraordinary amounts of grapes and, and they find them to be, you know, just fantastic, they'll make a vintage. So they don't make one every year. Um, they made an 03, which um, I think is current vintage um, that you should probably see out there. Um, and, and I believe an 04. You know, so it, again, with the, the vintage means that this was a spectacular year. If you see a, mm -hmm. a, a year on the bottle, that means it was a really good harvest that year. It was a, really a good harvest. It was, or, or the harvest was um, produced grapes that were a high enough quality to really warrant making mm -hmm. a wine that year. And I want to ask, in the remaining minutes of the show, that uh, I wouldn't recommend somebody go out and buy a $140, $150 bottle of champagne if you've never had champagne before. Right. No. I yes, would strongly not. recommend Probably not. You, you do something like we've done on the show. You start off with something a little bit more yeah. approachable and taste them first. Because if you just buy that, if you've never had champagne before. You'll yeah. never drink you'll, anything you'll, ever again. No. You, you won't know what you're drinking. <laughs> well, so. yeah, it's progressive too. It's, it's, you know, you might try that and be like, blah. Yeah. You know, your palate has to expand with, like with all wine, anything you've tried before, the first time you try anything, it's a little bit odd. Mm -hmm. um, and then you grow to kind of appreciate like nuances and qualities of that style. So yeah. maybe not start with Krug. What is the, the retail price point on this? Roughly. So this varies. I would say in Connecticut, you'll find 150, 175 okay. for the Grand Cuvée. Um, and once you know the history and the story of the wine, I mean, it, it, it makes the most sense. Um, you're drinking history in a bottle. Yeah. Um, you so know. I, I want you to know this is officially the most expensive bottle we've had on the show. Oh, it is. <laughs> you know, I think that's right. I Hooray. thought the uh, um, Chateau Montalena that uh, I did a show on. You weren't. You weren't on that I one. Wasn't. Um, but we had, I think it was, I think it was a hundred twenty, hundred thirty dollar bottle of red, one of their older. Well, this vintages. blows it away. But it? now, <laughs> yeah, Bubbles has officially. That's so funny. Taken the top tier. That's great. The most expensive wine by the least pretentious wine person. I love that. <laughs> on your show. So we got about a minute left in the show, and Kristen, I want to ask. You know, obviously you're expecting, but what else is on track for for Kristen in coming 2015? Uh, ooh. That's a mystery. Oh, a mystery. I think whatever, whatever the this Russian one has in store. Actually, yeah. <laughs> well, there's yes, going to be a lot of studying <laughs> about Russian sparkling wine, apparently. Um, but yeah, no, you'll, you'll, uh, you know, you'll see me out there doing my thing. I work for a distributor here in Connecticut, um, you know, and I spend a lot of time in restaurants. Um, You're in town too? Do you uh, do it? Yeah, I'm, I'm in West Hartford very often, Hartford, West Hartford. So you'll see me dragging a wine bag down the street and there's usually mm -hmm. delightful goodies in there. You're, you're free to welcome it, mention any accounts if you want. Uh, so. um, well, um, well, retailers? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you could definitely go to the Wise Old Dog on um, uh, 610 South Quaker Lane, I'm sure. That's I know where I met you. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. right yeah. Yeah. And I know he's been on the show a few times, but he definitely has these as well. So, but, you uh, were, Yeah, you were tasting Veuve Clicquot that night. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, as we uh, wrap up our show, and 2015 is right around the corner, literally hours or days, depending Ooh. on when you're watching this show. I want to thank Thanks. Kristen. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I want to thank Jim for four years now, yes. right? Happy New, Year. Happy New Year's. <laughs> thanks to all our viewers, our watchers. Thanks to WHC TV, great TV channel. And thanks to everybody at the station for helping us do what we do. Mm -hmm. So until next time, keep, keep us all of us in your wine, wine cellar. cellar. <laughs>